Uh, as Richard mentioned, my name is Tracy Evans, and I'm a partner and co-founder of Open Strategy Partners. And I'd like to talk to you today about trust, the 10 ways to build better connections uh, and also build better businesses and better communities. Um, OSP was born out of some conversations and strong ideas about communication uh, that has now become our communication model, which underpins everything we do. Uh, and it's called authentic communication. And it's based on three elements that we see here, uh, empathy, clarity, and trust. Um, and so uh, based on that, I naturally gravitate towards any material written <laughs> on these topics. And I got the inspiration for this talk from a book written by Canada's former governor general, uh, David Johnston. Uh, the book was called uh, Trust, 20, 20 Ways to Build a Better Country. And in this book, he, uh, he implores us to see that trust is gained through our actions and decisions on our doing and not merely saying on the basis that can be observed and measured rationally. Um, is a quote from the book. And he really wants us to explore the attitudes, habits, and approaches that people, um, that make people, businesses, organizations, and countries uh, trustworthy. And it was really interesting, and I highly recommend the book. Um, so in this talk, I'd like to share with you 10 very practical tips um, to mindfully build stress trust, not stress, uh, trust into your communications and also to make the argument that if we put actions like these at the core of how we communicate, uh, that we can build better connections, businesses and communities. <clears throat> um, so let's step back for a second and think about why trust actually matters. And um, my theory or philosophy is that uh, more and more people are making values-based decisions, um, including, but especially around uh, where they work, where they contribute, and definitely what tools and services uh, they use or support. Um, and I would argue that trust is one of the most important underlying values that influence pe people's choices. Um, and for people to engage with your company, your project, your product, they need to connect with you. And to do that, they need trust. So what is trust? Um, of course, we uh, need the Oxford definition uh, of trust, and that's um, the firm belief in the reliability, truth, or ability of someone or something. Um, but actually, it's far more complicated than that. Um, that's a really simplistic view. Um, trust is an often overlooked phenomenon, but it's an important one that's worth deeper consideration, um, in my opinion. Trust is especially important in how we communicate the value of open source technology products and services, um, the value of which is highly complex and often abstract, and where the story around a given set of features and benefits can be told in a multitude of ways. Um, that's a really important view to have. <clears throat> um, so I really like Stephen Covey's model of trust. Um, to me, it stands the test of time and it fits very well with open source technology products and services. Uh, when we look at his model, we can see that it breaks down into two main categories, uh, competence and character. And um, on the competence side, it solves the questions, uh, things like, can you solve my problem? Can you solve it better than any alternative? And can I expect a high level of knowledge and experience to be baked into your product or service? Um, and then over on the character side, um, it looks more at things like, you know, do your values align with mine? Um, and this question, I'd like to break this down into three different types of values, um, those being moral, technical and business values. Um, so for example, with moral values, um, the question can be, do they source their materials in a sustainable way? Um, do they pay fair wages? Do they have a diverse recruiting culture? Um, on technical values, it could be things like, do they and how do they use open source and open standards? Does it align with the way that we use it? 
Um, do they treat users' data with respect? Uh, do they use DevOps practices um, to get highly technical? Um, and uh, on the third type of value, the business values, it can answer things like, is your business model competitive? Is it transparent? Is it fair? Um, and do you communicate in an open and authentic way? Um, this sort of structured catalog of questions is something that you should be visiting at both the strategic level as well as the content production level. Um, this should really come through in both of those practices. Um, so the domains where trust matters most um, might be domains that you happen to overlook. Um, we need to bring trust into our communication in all of these domains up here. So support and interaction, training, technical documentation, product communication, things like product pages, data sheets, demos, um, and of course, editorial communication like blog, social, PR. <clears throat> so getting down to business, let's dive into the 10 ways. So. Way number one is uh, be technically accurate always. Um, a simple, straightforward way to ensure technical accuracy is to interview the expert and if needed, ask them to review your work. Uh, this is especially important for marketers and technical writers who may not have the depth of knowledge um, that the developers do, for example. Way number two. Um, be precise in your language uh, and use zero hyperbole. Avoid things like best in class, only solution that, or overusing the word innovation uh, happens a lot. Um, never say it's the only uh, X you'll ever need or, or uh, claiming that one talk technology will solve all of your problems. Um, so avoid things like that. And it's, <sighs> Not only that these statements are inaccurate, they're also not helpful. Uh, they're so broad that it doesn't give the reader a clear picture of the value that you can actually deliver them. Way number three, keep your writing tight. Um, too much noise around what really needs to be communicated dampens the trust that we can build. Crisp, sharp, focused communication, however, gives us the clarity that we spoke of earlier. Way number four, um, a clear narrative structure. Um, and this is similar to tight writing in that it provides clarity, but it does so by taking the reader in hand and essentially leading them down a clear path. <clears throat> uh, way number five, so an easy to navigate informational structure makes the journey easy and flexible for your reader. It allows them to choose their own adventure and consume the bits of information that's most relevant to them. Um, we do this with things like descriptive headlines, breaking down, breaking the text down to smaller paragraphs that are easy to scan, using bullet points and other formatting to call out the important bits. Um, this, is, uh, this is really important for trust. And uh, way number six is always use uh, logical rigor and of course, avoiding logical fallacies. And um, I'd like to take just a minute here to, uh, to provide a few examples um, of logical fallacies. First one being um, overgeneralization. So, the writer bases the argument on insufficient evidence. Um, the writer draws a larger conclusion than the evidence supports. And so if you are claiming that CMS A is better than CMS, is a better CMS, uh, you would need to do fairly exhaustive research and comparison with object, uh, objective standards and unbiased results to warrant that claim. Um, you can, however, talk about a specific set of functionality that supports a particular use case that you haven't seen anywhere else. Um, that's perfectly valid. Uh, the second logical fallacy that I want to share is a non sequitur or it doesn't follow, meaning so this is where the writer's conclusion is not necessarily a, a logical result of the facts. Uh, for example, super simple example, stating that because CMS A has more functions, 
it's a better CMS uh, than CMS B. Obviously, more doesn't equal better. Um, a third one that we have is begging the question. So the writer presents as truth what is not yet proven by the argument. So before an argument on a topic can be made or a solution offered, the reader must be convinced that there is a problem. Um, and the last example that I'll share with you is um, called the red herring. Um, this is where the writer introduces a completely irrelevant point uh, simply to divert the reader's attention from the main issue. Um, and you may do this unconsciously. So in reviewing your writing and reasoning, make sure that you examine the suppositions and the conclusions you've made and make sure that you are not making diversionary or non-relevant points to support your argument. Um, a concrete example would be citing sales figures to show that one CMS A um, so to sh showing that CMS A has, a higher, has higher sales than CMS B, this doesn't prove that CMS A is a better platform than CMS B um, for a given set of needs. Way, uh, way number seven, so, making, so make mindful claims by avoiding things like binary claims, which is, you know, stating that something is good or bad um, or absolute claims, meaning best, worst and things like that. Um, and certainly avoid negativity. Um, it's, it's better to respect the, the nuance and the situations where your product may not actually be the best fit. Um, and using FUD or fear, uncertainty and doubt um, in our communication, um, and diminishing the value of the competitor doesn't help us build trust. Um, it's quite the opposite. So focus on what value you deliver and not what the competition doesn't. Um, this doesn't mean that you shouldn't do comparisons. Um, just don't, do, don't use it to paint the competition in, into an especially bad light. So, um, way number eight is backing up your claims with evidence. And so uh, we have a couple of different different types of um, dif different types of evidence. So we have quantitative evidence, which is things like statistics, industry reports, other research. Um, we have case studies with quantifiable outcomes. <clears throat> And if we want to look at qualitative evidence, which is um, something that we see a lot of, um, that's things like expert claims, testimonials, um, anecdotal stories, for examples, um, and um, case studies with qualitative outcomes uh, and backing up a benefit claim by explaining how the product is actually built to support that benefit. Um, our product provides X benefit because it's built containing YZ features that also helps um, back up your claim. Um, and following on that is also documentation. So <laughs> the other thing that we wanna do when we think about um, claims uh, or backing up our claims with evidence um, is looking at the quality of the evidence. And so it's important to ask ourselves, is each piece of evidence in the, in the content piece, is it valid? Is it relevant? Is it unique? Um, and is the evidence, um, is the evidence directly connected with a cause and effect relationship to the claim? So, um, and we can absolutely make emotional claims without evidence when appropriate, especially when quoting somebody else. Um, for example, uh, making a statement like, by working together, we make something greater than the sum of its parts. Um, that's perfectly valid. Uh, way number nine, um, speak from or reference an authoritative voice. Um, the, the authoritative voice might be your internal technical expert. It might be a community-based expert. Um, you can also reference research um, from a trusted source. 
um, to have that authoritative voice. So, and uh, last but not least, way number 10, uh, recognize and acknowledge others for their expertise and knowledge, uh, contributions and competitive offerings. This is something that open source communities tend to do quite well, actually. And, um, and it's a very important factor in building trust. Oh, there we go. Um, so um, I believe that these actions and ways of communicate of communicating lead to more trust, and more trust equals more connection, and more connection equals happier people, stronger communities, and better businesses. Um, my hope is that trust infused communication becomes more and more the norm, um, and I also believe that uh, this will make the world a better place. And I believe that the open source communities can play a leading role in this. So think uh, that was the next one. So sources for all the beautiful images, of course, came from Unsplash. And that's everything. So thank you so much for your time. And I'm ready for your questions. Thank you so much. That was great. Um, really excellent to hear how you view trust and how you view for open source. For anyone who's listening, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat or put them in the questions bar. Um, I thought this was a great talk. I have some questions. If okay. you're ready, Tracy. I am. I'm trying to what? click over to the StreamYard tab. but uh, It's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm watching that. So I'll, I'll let you know. Okay. You're getting a few hearts right now. So oh, great. people like, oh, okay. there's no questions as of yet. Okay. Um, okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah. So one question I had was you talk about speaking from an authoritative voice. Yeah. And in open source, I increasingly see with small projects, this is really easy. You know, if it's a small module and there's one person, then all the docs come from them. Yeah. But with larger projects, I yeah. often find that things tend to devolve until you have this sort of vanilla marketing, normal technical documentation speak where there's no real person behind it. And so the authoritative voice becomes the voice of the project itself in a way. Yeah. How, how do, you, do you, uh, do you advise people to try to put more quotes from maintainers or something? How, how do you try to make it not so vanilla, but also more authoritative and, and more yeah. relevant to people and more personal for larger docs? Yeah, um, and I think Part of the answer was actually formulated in your question. Um, it, I Sorry for begging the question. <laughs> I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> no. You mentioned that in number five. <laughs> no, no. Um, uh, no, I think that it's, um, I think it is important to not just have um, sort of a, a vanilla project voice. Of course, you want some consistency um, and you want some sort of uh, uh, consistent style of voice, um, but it's also really important to highlight uh, the people behind the technology. And so the contributors and the maintainers, um, it's important that they have a voice and that they're represented um, in all of the different types of communication um, in any open source technology um, and including documentation. Um, and, you know, it's, I think it's really helpful for people when they come to consume any of that content, if they start to see um, some names and get to know who are the main players um, in the community, that can also um, be quite motivating for, um, uh, for them to make their own contribution as well and to participate. And so I think, um, I think we should encourage uh, highlighting um, the, the community's voice, contributors and maintainers. I like that answer. Thank you so much. Um, one question, another question I have is for readmes for again for small projects um, mm -hmm. because for for much larger ones, there's there's often someone who thinks about these things. But for maintainers out there, how do you expect people to build a narrative when really it's just description, install, usage, license, contribute, end? 
How, how do you build a narrative through your documentation? Do you have any suggestions? Oh, that's a that's a very good question and a very tricky one to to answer. Um, I think that you can build a narrative um, across your documentation by um, tying all of the the feature and benefit stories um, together and weaving those throughout your documentation. And for any given piece, like the README file, of course, there's like you know the the specific elements that people are expecting, um, but there's no reason why you can't put a little bit of context or a little bit of backstory um, at the beginning or the end of the document um, to help tie that narrative across the whole um, all of the technical documentation. That's a good answer. Thank you. By the way, we've lost your video. I don't know if that was intentional. Uh, uh. No. Um, oh. <laughs> okay. I <laughs> just want to let you know. Again, if anyone has any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. Right. I'm very happy to talk about this topic because I, I really love it. So I have some more going on. Um, to, 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 how would you like to speak to policymakers at the ability to provide funding? Yes, this was an interesting question I had from the very beginning. So you say things like don't use the word innovative too much, you know, avoid yeah. buzzwords. Yeah. Right? Yeah. What happens when an open source project needs to talk to people who use those languages to speak to their constituents? I'd say yeah. if you need funders or you need policymakers, they want oh, those words. Yeah, they really do. They really, really do. Oh, and there is no perfect answer to this. Um, so just to set that up from the beginning. Um, I, I think there are some careful language choices that you can make um, where you, you can get around um, not using those buzzwords or not using them so often um, or um, explaining them in a little bit more depth and um, you know a, a little bit more of a concrete background. Um, so if you're going to use a word like innovative, of course it's not you know, we don't have to completely eliminate that um, from our vocabulary, um, but we should explain how we're innovative. How are you actually different? Um, because the point about not using buzzwords is not is to eliminate the expectation that just using these words at a high level is going to solve. Um, it, you know, is going to give them the understanding and the impression that that we'll have what they need. Um, and so, as long as we back up those specific claims um, or back up using those words with um, a concrete explanation. Um, I think that's that might be the happy path. So that brings me to my next question. And again, if you have any other questions, feel free to drop them in the chat or the questions bar for those who missed me saying that the first two times. Um, you talk about backing it up. So a lot of trust isn't just using language, but being able to actually embody the language that you use. How do you publicly in the open manage expectations with people who now have an expectation that you will back it up? Where do you, do you have any tools you suggest for, for keeping a list of things that you've promised or for making sure that everyone knows like that, that you're, that's more of a project management project management question. I just wonder, like mm -hmm. on the back end, how do you make sure that you always fulfill everything that you say in your docs? Um, actually, we have a very specific tool for this, and we call it the value map. Um, I don't know that anybody else um, uses something like this, but essentially, it's um, a tool where we collect um, an inventory of every single feature and benefit. Um, that a particular piece of software has. And we make sure that we um, that the inventory is complete and we make sure that it's in the language um, following the principles that we believe in and what we've just discussed. And all of the um, marketing communications or technical communications that are um, built, they're built upon that value map. So it comes from like this concrete, structure. Um, so that's essentially how we really um, approach that issue. That's really fascinating. I would love to see one of those in action. Um, what sort of people sure. does Open Strategy Partner normally work with? What sort of organizations? What size? Um, 
size ranges. Um, we work with um, small and medium sized technical agencies, but we also work with um, large associations and um, companies. We operate almost exclusively in, in the open source space. And we have, um, so for example, we work with uh, Typo3, the association, um, as well as the commercial arm, the GmbH, um, and an agency within uh, within that community. We also are quite active in the uh, Drupal community. Um, and, uh, and yeah, essentially we love uh, technology and especially open source is our home base. So you work with with large communities. I mean, Drupal's huge, and and that's great. Yeah. Um, yeah. How do you get values from large communities? You use questionnaires, you use surveys. What do you do? Um, that that is a fascinating question, and um, the Drupal community is actually a really great um, example where they've gone through um, several iterations and effort around building their values um, and something that we do actually with our clients at a smaller level um, is help them identify their values so that they can bring out the right character and tone in their communication. Um, and there's several different schools of thought um, about how to build build values. So there's, um, there's an inclusive approach where you might survey the community, find out their feedback, collect that, aggregate it, sort it out, um, and then articulate them based on that. And there's another school of thought, which is that the leadership alone um, should try to develop these, um, these values. And um, the Drupal community actually did a, a hybrid of these two solutions. So it was essentially the, the leadership team in the association um, with an external consultant um, that worked on their latest version of their values, um, which are very, they're the best articulated values I've seen. So I'd, I'd encourage people to check them out. Um, and the way that they went about doing this in a hybrid way is that they, uh, I believe they did interview some key people within the community and got their input. Um, and then I believe they went away on an executive retreat and you know worked through them and articulated them from there, which is a great approach. Yeah, that sounds excellent. Um... And I think given the 10 steps that you have, that would also really, really help. Starting from the value chain and then going forward and saying, does the documentation match these things? Are we being honest, forthright, using the right words, putting yeah. our money where our mouth is? This is, uh, this is great stuff. Thank you so much. I really great. appreciate it.